Vandenberg will open. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, for my colleagues and me, it's a great pleasure to welcome you here today to this uh, workshop. One year after, one year after the workshop of last year on climate services in Covent Garden. Um, we really would like to thank you for your interest. We were impressed with the strong interest uh, shown in attending this uh, workshop and uh, we regret we had to um, stop the registrations earlier than uh, we had uh, hoped because of capacity limitations. But uh, the debates today will be filmed and uh, will be broadcast um, after uh, today. I think it's fair to say that the interest um, in the impacts of climate change um, is due to increasing awareness of what the impact of climate change could be. Um, unfortunately, we've, uh, we're having these um, headline-grabbing disasters, uh, like uh, the one of uh, Cyclone Pam in Vanuatu uh, over the last days, uh, which uh, show again what disasters uh, can happen. And some experts attribute directly or indirectly the destructive force of such cyclone to uh, climate change. Um, but I think it's also in day-to-day -day, uh, instances uh, that we are seeing how people um, are asking more and more questions about what climate change will mean uh, for them. I had a colleague calling me recently uh, he said, well, I know you work on climate. Um, I'm intending to buy an apartment on the Dutch coast. Can you tell me if I should do it or not? Um, my brother-in-law is fed up uh, with Belgium, and he is looking to buy a farm in the south of Spain. He wants to change life. He goes to the bank. Um, he wants to take a loan for 20 years, to pay back in 20 years. But the bank is saying, Ula, we've heard something about the impact of climate change in the south of Spain. Will there be water there in 20 years' time? Will you be able to pay back the loan if you make that investment? If you want to guarantee water there, what additional investment will it take? Where do you turn for such kinds of questions, for such need of advice, uh, for intelligence? on the impact of climate change. If you have a health-related concern, you go to see a doctor. If you are a company, um, you can go to a management consultant, you can go to an auditing firm, advertising firm, etc. If you want to have information on financial institutions, you can go um, to credit rating agencies, if you still trust them. But if you think of it, the image of a doctor could be instructive for the case of climate services. Um, indeed, if, you, if you're not feeling well, if you feel that something is changing in your metabolism, in your uh, c condition, you go and see a doctor. The doctor um, makes a diagnosis and gives you advice. And the best advice is the advice on prevention because we all know that prevention is better than cure. Um, and often it's about changing your behavior. And the doctor tells you what kind of behavioral change you should do to make sure that you prevent uh, a disease or a bad health condition. And if you're already more advanced, then the doctor gives you advice on a cure. Um, so there is also here an interplay between prevention and cure, mitigation and adaptation. Now the doctor makes a diagnosis and gives you counsel on the basis of knowledge that has been gathered through decades of research and continuing research. He or she does not have all the answers, the certainty about what will happen uh, to you, but that is no reason not to give counsel because a doctor typically works within margins of probability. And increasingly, what the doctors are finding in the clinic is also setting the research agenda in turn. And one of the 
biggest advances now in health research is uh, thanks to translational research, where there is a very quick feedback between the clinic and the basic health research, um, which is often, in most cases, publicly funded. So I think what we're looking for is who will perform the function of the doctor for counseling us, our economy, our society, on climate change. Not on climate change in general, but on what it means for your business, for your business operation, for your city management, for your property in the future. We have at the European Commission, as you know, a very long and proud tradition of investing in climate research through successive framework programs. And that has contributed to an improved understanding and modeling of climate and the Earth system. It um, has been geared uh, a lot towards understanding the impact of human activity on the climate. And that understanding um, has helped us, it has improved, but it is far from complete yet. Uh, we still need to continue research uh, for a better understanding. But at the same time, I think we need to make the information and the research more relevant for economy and society. So that altogether we can take smarter decisions in the face of climate change. Um, so that we take cost-effective decisions for mitigation, but that we also adapt in the most cost-effective way to a changing climate and the impact that will have on us. So our ambition, therefore, is to create a market for climate services, a European and even a global market for climate services. That ambition is the expression of a paradigm shift in European research and innovation policy, which is also translated in the Horizon 2020 program for research and innovation, where under the societal pillar, our mandate and our mission is no longer to fund science as such, but really to see how we can transform societal challenges into innovation opportunities and invest in the creation of the markets of the future. The markets which will supply and should supply solutions for addressing these societal challenges like climate change, but also working on the demand side for such solutions. Um, and it's in that context um, that we have given to the expert group a mandate after last year's uh, workshop in Covent Garden. We asked the expert group, can you please help us in designing a roadmap that lays out actions to be taken and investments uh, to be made to create such a market for climate services. I think it's fair to say that was not an easy job. And I think the members of the expert group have been doing quite some hair scratching at times. Um, but the job done, we feel, is a very good one. And at DG Research and Innovation, we strongly welcome the roadmap and we wholeheartedly thank the members of the group for their excellent work and their commitment uh, to making uh, this roadmap, which I think personally is a first of a kind. It is really a systematic yet focused analysis of all the variables and parameters, the actors and factors that come into play when we talk about creating a possible market. It sets a framework for action and proposes choices of investment in research and innovation. We would like to see this roadmap as a living reference framework for many act actors that are involved and the many that will become involved in the future. And on the supply side of the climate data, research, information, intelligence, we already have a broad research community. We have the Joint Programming Initiative on Climate Services, which is increasingly active in this space. We have the Copernicus, uh, which is giving us a fantastic capacity uh, with the climate services, um, and we have some of the leading actors here present uh, today. 
We also have um, institutions like the Climate and Knowledge and Innovation Community through the European Institute for Technology. And these are only just a few at European level. There are many, many more at national and regional levels as well. But we now need to find the right modalities to bring in the users of climate services. Existing users, but even more importantly, the potential users of the future. Be they businesses, business sectors, utilities, cities and regions, and policymakers at large, um, both in Europe and globally. I can say that the roadmap delivered by the expert group will be for us also at the European Commission a reference framework. And we are in this and we will be in this for the long haul. This is not something for one or two years. This is something that will influence and determine our work and our investments over many years uh, to come. We're already integrating this in our programming for the 2016-17 work programs of Horizon uh, 2020, where we can also rely on the input we got um, on a call for ideas we published just before Christmas for um, demonstration projects, large-scale demonstration projects in the field of climate services. We've had quite a good response uh, to this call for ideas, which will help us in designing our call for proposals so that we really target large-scale demonstration uh, projects which show and test what possible services could be on climate in the future. But it goes broader than Horizon 2020 and research and innovation, of course. I think we also will want to see how this can influence and help and support other policy uh, frameworks, like, for example, the climate adaptation strategy, which will be reviewed in 2017. And we're very happy to have with us uh, today Jos Delbeke, the Director General of DG Climate. But also in other areas, instances of European policy making, if we think, for example, about financial or non-financial reporting by companies and sectors, um, this is clearly an area where um, climate services could play a very important role, both in fulfilling the obligations for reporting, but also in driving uh, the reporting itself. We will have to work on issues like data policy. Um, what will be the infrastructures uh, for all these data? What kind of protocols do we need? How do we cross climate data with other data, socioeconomic data, etc.? We will need to see how we can ensure the quality of climate services, uh, because we want these climate services to be very user-tailored, but always science-based. Ladies and gentlemen, what we are witnessing in Europe today is an uncertain investment climate. And that is really what we need to address if we want to promote growth, jobs and investment, which is the number one priority for the Juncker Commission. And we want to do this in a more sustainable way than may, what we may have done in the past. But that investment uncertainty is increasingly compounded by uncertainty around the climate change impacts on our businesses, on our economy, on our society. And this is where the agenda for climate services comes in. We hope that the roadmap, which will be presented and discussed today, will be an important step in the direction of supporting society to respond to the climate change challenge. We hope that this roadmap will not be just the Commission's roadmap, but that there will be a broadening ownership. And we hope that today and after today, you will tell us what is needed to make that happen and that you will help to make that happen. Creating a market for climate services will only happen if we can build a momentum and mobilize many actors to work together and be entrepreneurial in delivering uh, these services. And I trust that today, together, we can make today's workshop another milestone in that process and in that ambition. But before going to the presentation of the roadmap as such, it's my great pleasure to introduce um, our dear colleague, Jos Delbeke, Director General in DG Climate. 
if there is one person in the Commission who can tell us about the certainties and uncertainties, not so much of climate, but of climate action policy, then it's probably Jos Delbeke. And for us, Jos, it's very important and significant that you're here today. And we're really curious to tell us that you tell us how this can help your policy. Thank you very much. Good morning, uh, colleagues and friends, and uh, thanks, uh, Kurt, for the nice words. Uh, thank you also for the opportunity to say a few words about uh, what we are currently planning in the EU when it comes to climate action. Uh, and having glanced uh, in the roadmap that you are going to uh, elaborate uh, further on in the coming uh, hours, days, months, uh, and years, uh, I'm really encouraged because we in DG Climate, uh, we are a heavy user of data, of knowledge, uh, because without good data, without good uh, reflection also, you never get anywhere in uh, policy development. So we know uh, firsthand how important the work is that you all are working on. Now, um, I was uh, last year also having the pleasure of being around and just reflecting about what happened last year, I would like, since last year, I would like to uh, indicate at least three uh, very important events. Uh, the first is that the IPCC finalized its work on the fifth assessment report, uh, an impressive piece of work, but the most important is that uh, never before we saw such a list of affirmative messages on climate change. It's clear, it's clearer than ever, the influence of humans is uh, very clear, and the two centigrade target even if we know that it's going to be very difficult to reach it, is being reconfirmed. So um, I think that is a, a very important uh, uh, piece of work that came to an end. And we know that for us in the industrialized world, in the developed countries part of the world, we will have to reduce our emissions by 2050 by at least 80% uh, domestically. Uh, we have the fourchette that we are using between 80 and 95 percent, and that is the, uh, uh, the, the, the margin of maneuver we have for the uh, uh, import of international credits, which just puts the light on how important the credits and the credibility related to credits are going to appeal on climate services across the globe. So the first, the science, we saw a major uh, step forward. The second is that our leaders, the heads of state and government, have been preparing a framework for 2030. And uh, it was not just the Commission or the Member States or the European Parliament, it was the highest body, the heads of state and government, who decided that by 2030 our emissions should be at least 40% lower than in 1990, and that we have to reach these emission reductions only inside the EU. I think that's a very important binding target uh, that has been achieved and uh, is now being put by the Commission and legislation. Alongside, there are two, at least two other important targets that, was, uh, that were de de decided upon. That is that renewable energy will continue with at least 27% by 2030 and that on energy efficiency, we have to reinforce our efforts also with at least 27% compared to the baseline that was uh, developed earlier on. And in all that, uh, the role of markets and market forces is reconfirmed. The role of the ETS, although we know that also a bit of work needs to be done to have, again, a balance in the market like we had in the earlier years. So um, on the basis of this work by heads of state and government, the EU, two weeks ago, succeeded in submitting its INDC, that is its pledge, to the UNFCCC, to the United Nations. And with that, the EU is the first G20 player of having submitted its pledge to Paris. Uh, so that's uh, another line of work, the second one, on which I would like to draw your attention. With that, and I come to my third point, the agenda for the Commission has been set for the coming five years. You know we have a new Commission. One of the first elements on which the Commission formulated a comprehensive strategy 
was its strategy on the energy union with a forward-looking climate policy. Now, this uh, policy was adopted two weeks ago and sets out the agenda for work in the Commission, for which at least half of what is being said in the energy union is having a direct relevance to uh, climate action. So I would say we have done our bit to create political momentum because what we all want to do is bring home success from Paris. At the end of the year, we will have a major negotiation session. The whole world is going to come together and the signs are not too bad. I think political momentum is building up from Europe, but also from the United States, also from China. And you have seen the latest figures by the IEA. It seems to be uh, the first time that we see a plateauing of global greenhouse gas emissions in uh, years to come. And it may well be that this is being confirmed by the Chinese in their discussion on the peaking date. They officially declared that peaking would happen at, at the latest by 2030. And now the odds are that the sources of energy production that are low in carbon in China are growing that fast, and the moving out of coal is going that fast, that we may see a peaking date years before 2030. So it's not all that bad when we look around, and for Paris, we will have to have efforts by all countries. So the pledges by all countries, and of course, the G20 countries are the most important ones, because they represent some 80% of the emissions globally. And now what is important in these pledges is that they all have to be formulated. And so climate services in the formulation of those pledges are going to become very important. And besides the pledges, where we are insisting on very hard in, uh, in the EU, is that the other major element coming out of Paris is going to be the cluster around MRV monitoring, reporting, and verification. And that is uh, easy to spell out towards you, because you know what it means, monitoring, reporting, verification. In the wider public, it's very difficult to make that argument, because it's very dry. It is not directly appealing to the man in the street. But if we have pledges, and if we have a good MRV system, we have everything we need to come back later, after Paris, on whatever will have to be done after Paris. So also MRV, that's another word of the climate services that you are working on. So my first point would be that um, looking back over the last 12 months and looking forward for the coming 12 months, your business will be in business. Now, I, I glanced, uh, as I said, the roadmap for climate services and I, I was really impressed uh, to see so many elements brought together and I picked out two elements that I think are absolutely important for your further work, and that is that um, a market for those services needs to be built. Let's not have the illusion that only public authorities are going to produce these figures, this knowledge, this data. Markets uh, have to produce that, and markets have to exchange those data, and uh, should earn also, many of you, a job in this sector. The other element is that uh, for a market, there must be relevance to the end users. The people have to know what they can do with the data that you are producing. And so you will have to make them very clear and eagerly to be picked up by businesses, by administrations, by households, by uh, uh, final actors, by individuals such as you and me. So that is going to be uh, very important for determining the future of what you are working on. Let me make three comments related to adaptation, to mitigation, and to international cooperation. The first on adaptation. Um, adaptation is the local side of climate change. It is there where climate change happens. And it is there where, unfortunately, we will see a lot of changes in a very different manner compared to where you are located on Earth or where you are located in Europe. You cannot compare what is going to happen in this part of Europe to what is going to happen in the Alps or in the Mediterranean. Uh, so that is going to be very local. And that's why we have been encouraging uh, very forcefully the mayors who are 
the most local authority uh, close to the citizen and to the local level, the convenant of the mayors have been uh, incorporating climate adaptation into their explicit policy. And the one element I was impressed about talking to the mayors is the tremendous need for information. Uh, they recognize the problem. They know, yes, that they have to insulate their buildings and that they have to have uh, better uh, and more sophisticated lighting systems in the streets. That is all well understood. But when it comes beyond that, they are in a tremendous need for information. And so uh, that is a, a product that you can produce. And there is one element uh, that is going to be very important. You know that in spending the European budget, our leaders have decided that 20% of the climate budget must be mainstreamed to climate change. That means that spending directly or, or indirectly the budget must have an impact on climate change. Now, if you look at the European budget, where are the biggest parts? There are only three. There is agriculture, there is research and development, the field you are working on, but there is also the regional development, regional and local development. And it is there where lots of money are being spent today in poorer regions in particular, where new infrastructure is being built, where new cities are being built, and where there is a tremendous need for climate services like the ones you are going to produce. So the mayors, the local level, building up in this parts of Europe, climate relevant programs need your data because if they cannot make their point, they will not be able to drain the financial revenues that they hope to drain uh, their way. So on adaptation, there is a huge market out there. Uh, we did a little bit through the European Environmental Agency. We have a portal, etc. But that is all in need for being fed. More data must be produced to, uh, to locate it there and on other places. So adaptation is certainly going to be a booming business. Let me turn to mitigation. And there um, we uh, are developing uh, with the help of lots of information, sophisticated models. I think Kurt was uh, underlining uh, the dimension for our modeling, which is cost effectiveness, because we know that climate policy potentially can be very expensive. So keeping climate policy as low cost, as cheap as possible, is very important. And it is only through good information that you can produce that. So we are a very intensive user in DG Klima, but uh, we also see that in other parts of Europe, at uh, the level of the capitals and the member states, the local level, the lender, uh, the regions, there is a lot of need uh, for more information. And then uh, let me come to the international cooperation. Um, I think we have a good story to tell. Uh, we have good policies that are being copied in the world. Uh, we have built up a sector related to uh, the good technologies and also related to the services that are related to climate change. And there is a lot of appetite to cooperate with you, with us. And I think we should grab that uh, opportunity. The world is big and there is a big need. And have, having Paris, where INDCs and MRVs uh, systems are going to be of incredible importance, there is a huge market in front of you. So I really would hope that you seize that opportunity. It can be translated in many different ways. It can be about disaster uh, risk reduction, uh, like we saw in Vanuatu over the weekend. Um, there are many different things uh, to do. There is a huge demand. Uh, think about uh, what we are developing on uh, global uh, for deforestation, uh, in particular tropical deforestation. Uh, one of the biggest challenges we have is not to put a price on what is being done, uh, we are very eager to do that, but to get good controlling systems. Because what on earth do you know when you pay for a service, what has happened on the basis of what you pay for in the middle of the rainforest, either in the Congo or in, uh, in, in Latin America or in Asia. So good services, earth observation systems, for example, is what we need uh, to monitor much better. Because if we want to have a payment for climate services, 
we will have to need excellent data. So there is plenty of things to uh, work on. Let me congratulate you again for uh, the new direction of work that has been taken here in developing uh, climate services. And I can reassure you uh, that uh, we in the policy development field and you in the generation of uh, data, we will have uh, lots of things to build together uh, more work on. Thank you very much.